Landing, the Chairman of the Trust, Mr. Sambat, Garland, the Chief Guest, Mr. C. Subramaniam, with the amendment. Dr. Ananda Krishnan, Vice Chancellor, Anna University. To Mr. Ram, member Rotary Club, Madras Mailapur. To Mr. P. T. Prabhakar, Governor, Rotary Club, Madras Mailapur. <laughs> Presidential address by Dr. Ananda Krishnan. Our very respected and beloved chief guest, the elder statesman and a person who has played a very key role in the destiny of this country Thiru CSR, the president of the Madras Educational Trust, Sri Sampath, Mr. Bilalan, and the distinguished speaker and the incoming governor, Mr. Prabhakar and Mr. Ram and all the other distinguished guests and students and friends. I first of all want to congratulate the Madras Educational Trust for having taken this initiative to celebrate the 50th year of the founding of the United Nations. I'm sure that you had a very stimulating discussion for the whole day and you probably are tired the end of the day. I am sure that you had an occasion to look at the United Nations, its achievements and its shortcomings in retrospect over the last 50 years and probably in prospect for the next 50 years to come. I would like to briefly make a few remarks because of my association with the United Nations for close to 16 years, both when I was in the embassy as well as I was an official of the United Nations, and uh, hope that the future of the United Nations would even be better than what it was in the last 50 years. If you have seen the newspapers and the journals in the last few days, you would have noticed that particularly in the editorial columns of many of the major national and even local newspapers, there was a sense of disappointment, and there was a sense of despondency about where is United Nations going, what is happening to the United Nations, and rightly so. A large organization like United Nations, which was founded with some ideals and goals in mind 50 years ago, it has gone through a glorious period, a proud moments in its history, and also certain periods where the very existence of the purpose of the United Nations was questioned. Now, it's a long history. But I would like to briefly put the whole thing in, in a very sketchy manner. The United Nations was founded 50 years ago, 
mainly as an operation for peace, peace in the world. This was for resolving conflicts, try to find solutions so that we would not, the world will not be facing another devastating world war. So I would like to divide this period of 50 years into very roughly, somewhat crudely, into three distinct periods. The first period, I would put it between 1945 and say roughly 1960. This was a period when the world was shell-shocked by the horror of the World War. The horror of the memory of the people was fresh about the horror of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The enormous cost the world has to bear for reconstructing this world from the devastations of the war, the price people have to pay, and the tensions and the torture of rebuilding a new world. This was a period roughly people had in their mind about war. We have to avoid war. So the Charter of the United Nations, one of the most beautiful documents ever evolved by consensus, and India has played a very crucial role right from the inception of the United Nations. And that's why I'm very happy to see Honorable C.S. here, who probably was on the center stage during the developments of the whole of the history of the United Nations. And India played a very crucial role, and that's why India is still concerned, and has always been concerned about the role of the United Nations and the future of the United Nations. So this was a period when India played a very important role in shaping the purpose and the goals of the United Nations. Then came the second period, I would put it roughly between 1960 and 1980. This was the period when the United Nations was probably at its peak United Nations recognized, people used to blame United Nations General Assembly as a talking shop. And people in the United Nations used to say at that time, it is better to shout at each other than to shoot at each other. This was a time when the United Nations recognized that peace does not mean simply absence of war. If you want to have peace, you have to do something more than just avoiding war. That you have to address the very basis of conflicts, basis of war, which means hunger, disease, misery, poverty, exploitation, unemployment, all the other things that go with the development of a human society. So the United Nations launched a series of initiatives during this period, and you would see, as a result of it, organizations like World Health Organizations did a great deal. Now, if you see anybody in a country like India above 40 years, you wouldn't find anybody with the large number of, I mean, less than 40 years, you would not find anybody with the number of poke marks and you would find, when I was a child, the smallpox was something that you have to automatically expect and suffer through it. But the United Nations were under the initiative of the United Nations. We have been able to totally and completely eradicate the smallpox from this globe, from the face of this earth. And this, similarly, in the field of education, the field of literacy, the field of culture. Look at the enormous amount of work the UNESCO did to save when the, uh, the Aswan Dam was built to save the heritages of the Egyptian monuments. 3,000 years of history was going to be submerged. Similarly, in the UNIDO, industrial organization, the food and agricultural organization, 
when the world was going through a misery of hunger, deaths, starvations. And in our own country, we have the standing examples of the initiatives that Dr. C. Subramaniam and people like Emma Swaminathan and all took. But then the work of the Food and Agricultural Organization added momentum, support, encouragement, and whatever help they can give. So the United Nations started addressing, the, look at the work of the UNICEF, the issues of children, child labor, exploitation of children, nutrition, malnutrition of children, the breastfeeding question, etc., etc. So the whole set of issues that relate to the development of human societies, human beings, in this, this became a matter of very urgent concern during between the 60s and the 80s in the United Nations. They were very proactive and they were very constructive and there were a large amount of help that the United Nations was able to get. Then something else happened at that time. The world was going through a phase of a Cold War and the developing countries, the poorer countries, were trying to establish, extract from both sides a certain degree of attention, certain degree of support, certain degree of um, aid for the betterment of their own societies. Because this, the period between 60 started out what I would call as a post-colonial period. Most of the countries in Africa, for instance, were liberated around the 60s. Of course, we got our independence around 47, but the African countries have to stay much longer to be able to attain their independence. When the independence did take place, many of the, for instance, a large country like Nigeria had only one university with an admission capacity of some 500 people in the year 1960. A country like Mozambique, when the Portuguese left, they pulled away the railway tracks and the bulbs from the railway stations. So this is a kind of a post-colonial period that the 60s witnessed. And so the United Nations had to come to the rescue of these countries. And so it did a very good job. But at the same time, the developing countries were pressing that there must be much greater support, much greater attention from the so-called developed countries both from the East and the West. So the confrontation started somewhere in the midway of this period, the North-South divide and the East-West divide, and as a part of the Cold War system. You would have heard of, you can go back and look at new international economic order. This was passed in the year 1974 or 75. It's a very exhaustive document Everybody subscribed to it, but nothing came out of it. Because there, the poorer countries, the developing countries were telling the developed countries, you give us more, you give us more, you give us more. And we want more. You have to give us more. This was the spirit with which the new international economic order. They said you must transfer 0.7% of your gross national product as a aid, the official development assistance didn't happen. Only 0.3% of the gross national product was transferred, and only four countries, the Netherlands, the uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, these were the only four countries which anywhere came close to 0.7% of the gross national product. The entire OECD countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, most of the European countries, plus Japan and the United States and Canada, which account for today almost 75% of the world's gross national product. The, world, the gross national product of the OECD countries is roughly of the order of $18 trillion, $18,000 billion. The world's gross national product is of the order of 24 or $25 trillion. So out of this came this demand during the 60s and 80s, you should give us more, but didn't happen. Then I'd like to quickly go to the period between 80 and the present time. 
This is the period of conservatism. This is the Reagan Thatcher era. The whole world was moving towards a conservative mode. This was post Carter era. The 60s and 80s saw eminent people of great stature Jawaharlal Nehru, Tito, Carter, Willy Brandt. So you can go on. A large number of giants, people with very high international stature, molded the working of these United Nations. Starting 80s, the pygmies started occupying the role. So when I say systemic failure, it's not the failure of the system of United Nations in terms of structure, organization, who is the director, who is the secretary general, what is the organization, whether you have this office here or that office here. It's not the organizational management failure of the but it is a kind of people who guided the destiny, who gave the policy, who gave the mandate, who set the goals, etc., for the United Nations. In the 60s and 80s, the World Conference on Environment, 1972, it took place. This was under the auspices of the United Nations, the Population Conference, the Desertification Conference, etc., etc., the Energy, World Energy Conference. So it stimulated people to think in larger terms, look at the distant future and what affects the human beings. But 80s and between 80 and now, I think the United Nations was very deliberately downgraded, were very deliberately stymied. Its purpose, people will not pay their contributions. This is a period between the 80 and 95 is a period when even Ford and Rockefeller foundations went to the background and the Heritage Foundation came to the top. I don't know how many of you have heard of Heritage Foundation. It is one of the most conservative, absolutely uh, abhorrible group of very highly educated people in the United, uh, United States. So this is the kind of a world that was created between the 80 and the 95. Now, we are in the age of 95 and beyond in pros prospect. I do not know what is going to be the future of the United Nations, what is going to be the future of the member states of the United Nations. But this is a post-communist era. We have gone to a new, the communism is more or less gone. And this is a world in which we don't know what the liberalization, the globalization and all that sort of thing is now being talked about. Now, what is going to be? I could only say what the United Nations should be and what it would be. I mean, this is a point that people could talk about any length of time. What it should be is, I think, the United Nations, one of its chief weaknesses, that it could not distinguish between what are those priorities in the world, global priorities, where United Nations were particularly, specifically competent to do, like the smallpox program. There are certain things in the world which United Nations is uniquely endowed to do. United Nations system, not just the headquarters in New York, I'm talking about all its other specialized agencies, etc. There are certain things United Nations, United Nations could only help the governments. If there are good governments, if the governments care to do things, United Nations can say, this is the things that you have to do. The issues like the population, like children, I don't think the United Nations are education for that matter. United Nations cannot solve the problem of primary education. It cannot, because if you just take, there was one estimate which I saw last week from United Nations report, it will take $58 billion simply to address the question of primary education if everyone has to. Who is going to pay $58 billion to the United Nations to remove the, to address the question of primary education? So the, there are, but United Nations can stimulate, prod, excite, give the help, support, training, that kind of a thing for the national system to deal with this problem. Then there is a third aspect, which there are certain things United Nations should never get involved in. That is simply for the local governments to deal with. There is, it's United Nations simply incompetent. It just will not be able to deal with that. And those are the kinds of things. So I think now the United Nations may have to move towards seeing what are those priorities. My second point is, I think the United Nations in its political agenda is going to be more and more ineffective. Because there, are not, there is not going to be a world war, uh, uh, as in my best judgment. But there, will be, there won't be a forest fire, there will be a lot of brush fires. And the United Nations will not be able to control, as we have seen, 
any of these brush fires. In the name of United Nations, somebody else will try to either set up the brush fire or extinguish the brush fire. But the United Nations as a system, it will only get the bad name. So the political agenda of United Nations is going to be much less effective. And therefore, in the present context, the post-communist era, the United Nations must send more and more of its attention on the social and the economic agenda of the world, where it can prove to be more effective. And how it will do, what it will do, we don't know. But I hope in the next few years to come, discussions like this, as India as one of the well-wishers, as a founding member, which has played a very key role, which has given the support, we must all be concerned to make sure that the United Nations plays its parts. And I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.